Good morning, everyone. We are so glad to have all of you here today. For those of you I don't know, my name is Betsy Samuel, and my husband, Joe, and I have been leading our adult forums uh, this past spring. And as you could probably tell, because his absence is usually pretty notable, um, my husband, Joe, isn't here today, and unfortunately, um, because of the, uh, the vestry retreat. So, uh, but I know he is here in spirit because he would be so excited uh, to be here to welcome um, Dr. Tarek El Gahari with us today. And Dr. El Gahari has wears many hats, and um, he is in, uh, involved at the Islamic Center of Potomac, as well as heading the Coexist Foundation, as well as Corporation and they are doing some very exciting things uh, around the world to uh, bring various cultures and um, religious groups together. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. El Gohari in what I hope is the first of, of many opportunities that we have to, to work together in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. So since Islam is such a complicated topic, <clears throat> I thought I would show you three pictures that summarize everything you need to know about Islam. You guys, you guys ready? This is the first picture. Does anyone know what this is a picture of? Does anyone understand the game of cricket? <laughs> so as Americans, you know, we think that this is, you know, a funny sport. Uh, people are holding a two by four trying to hit a ball, <laughs> wearing these white outfits. And if you listened to a uh, sports cast of the game of cricket, you would have no idea what was going on. You would hear things like wickets and stick it wickets and hookers and seams and all of these funny terminology. And more importantly, if I showed you the scoreboard of this game, you would have no idea what the score was, who was playing, where in the game we were, but yet cricket is called the gentleman's sport. And, and people will, you know, go to battle for their teams uh, in cricket. And that doesn't mean that cricket is a bad sport or it doesn't mean that we, we are bad people, it just means that we do not know the language of the game of cricket. And if we wanted to understand cricket, you would need to learn all of that funny vocabulary, well, to us it's funny, funny vocabulary, to be able to know what the game is about, what's going on, how you win it, and more importantly, if you saw the scoreboard, you would want to know who is playing, what the score was, and how the game is progressing. And a lot of what I do is just essentially helping people, even Muslims themselves, understand the language of Islam. To be able to understand a religion as vast and as intricate and as complex and as as elegant even and as sophisticated as, as my faith, it's very important that you just know the language, so you just know what's going on. How about this picture, maybe a little bit more familiar. <laughs> Imagine if you were getting on a plane and the captain was in front of you, and as the captain boarded the plane, he looked left and he saw this and he said, oh my God, what is that? <laughs> you wouldn't, wouldn't inspire a lot of confidence. Or imagine, God forbid, if the captain was incapacitated and you had to step in there and land the plane to safety. I mean, good Lord, I don't even know where to sit. Or all of those things on the top are buttons and switches. We don't know what any of that means. But if you are trained as a navigator or as a captain or as a pilot, I hope, you'll know what all that stuff means. And you'll be able to know where you're going, how high you are, what the fuel is like, what the consumption, is fuel, what the consumption of the fuel is so on and so forth, to be able to land the plane to safety. So a lot of what we're going to accomplish in the very few moments that we have this morning is really that, is to learn the gauges. Because Islam today, unlike other uh, traditions, is so much a part of our daily news cycle, so much of the daily conversation, that I think it's also important that you know where the gauges are, what's happening. You know, why is the gauge always seemingly on red. And then the last image, this is my favorite image. This is a, a control panel of a, a Russian nuclear power plant. Now what's interesting is that all the gauges have the same numbers. They all go from zero to seven. But they're all 
uh, pointing at different numbers and the gauges are different colors and there are all these red lights and if I think of a nuclear power plant and red lights I think it's really really bad but I hope to God that the person sitting or the person that took this picture knows that everything is fine I'm assuming uh, and is able to read those gauges and able to know what the power plant, how it's operating, plutonium levels, whether there's a, there's a threat or not, the temperatures, all of those kind of things. So as funny as these images are, really, that's what my job is. Uh, not just with you, but a lot of what I spend my, my days doing and my teaching opportunities is just teaching people to read the gauges, particularly when it comes to Muslims. Muslims need to, most importantly, need to be able to read the gauges so that they can know when, when something is red. And a lot of times I, I, interca I, in, I interact with people here, and Muslims here in this country and abroad, and there's definitely a red light. And I try to step in and be like, yo, let me, let's talk. Let's talk about that. Because they've read something wrong. And a lot of the problems that my own community has also deals with the language of Islam. So I think it's a shared, a shared, uh, a shared problem. So, we have this very uh, uh, nice teaching text. It's called the Hadith of Gabriel. You guys know who Gabriel is, right? Everyone knows who Gabriel is. Okay, good. We have something in common. And all, the, all, all Hadith means it's a, it's a text, it's a saying of the Prophet of Islam. So that's your first language uh, item. Uh, we, we believe very much in collecting and uh, verifying all of the statements, all of the actions, the life of the Prophet. because. His prophetic way for us is a source of author religious authority and legislation. We'll get to that in a second. In this text, uh, we have Gabriel, who comes in the form of a man, uh, as often times he would throughout the Prophet's life. And he sat amongst the Prophet and his companions, and he went to the Prophet and he, he asked him three questions. He said, what is Islam? So I thought this was an appropriate uh, text for this morning. So the Prophet says, Islam is that you say the testification of faith that there is no God but God and that Muhammad is the prophet of God. That's, that's our sort of, the, simil, the, the same as like the Shema prayer in the, in the Jewish faith. We pray five times a day. You fast the month of Ramadan, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. You give alms on your residual income, 2.5% on your residual income and that you make pilgrimage to Mecca once in your life if you're able to. So Gabriel says, oh, you've spoken the truth. So the companions, they, this was very strange that he would ask him a question and then he would, uh, that he would verify it. So this is the first question he asked Islam. And by the way, this text is how our seminaries are structured. The entire learning process for us is really essentially based on this text. So while it's very simple, it, it extrapolates into years and years of study. So Islam is the first thing. And they're all actions, things that we do. We pray, we give money, we fast. Well, in that case, you don't do something, but then you break your fast. So they're all related to actions, and we're going to get to that. The second question that Gabriel asks, he says, what is faith? And then the prophet lists the six articles of faith, that we believe in God, His angels, His messengers, His revealed books, destiny, the final hour, and destiny. And destiny, in another prophetic text, the prophet said, destiny basically means anything that hits you was meant to hit you, and anything that misses you was not meant to hit you. So these become our six articles of faith. So Islam makes a very big distinction between action and faith. And action, maybe a word that you're familiar with, is orthopraxy, correct action. And faith, or correct faith, is orthodoxy, correct belief. And while... Islam does have a very elaborate theology. The obsession of Islam over the years has been on action. So the law is very prevalent, very, very much uh, on the forefront, much more than theology. Very much like rabbinic Judaism. It's very similar to that experience. Where rabbinic Judaism has a very elaborate theology, but what's very important is the action, is the law. And then Gabriel asks this last question. He says, well, what is spiritual excellence? What is perfection in religion? You know, if you take those two and you sum them up, how, how do you express that? How do you live that? And then the Prophet says, and it's a very famous statement that mo most Muslims know, that you worship God as if you see Him, and if you do not, at least know that He sees you. These three questions that Gabriel asked the Prophet, for us, fo form the entire intellectual apparatus 
the entire paradigm, intellectual paradigm of Islamic thinking. There is the law, and all of the things that go into the law, all of the actions necessary, all of the preconditions, all of the conditions, everything that you can think about, about when you come to do something and act on something, all the questions that you would think about, that's the law. That's how we live our liturgical life, if you will. That's how we live our secular life, infused with our ethics. And then our belief system, these are things that we believe, it's an internal, you believe in the unseen, the things that we believe in, our attitude towards those things in the past, and our attitude towards those things that constantly happen to us. But those two things are supposed to manifest in this spiritual experience, that you worship God as if you see Him. Well, if you saw God everywhere, you'd be very, very different, and you would reflect what you saw than if you didn't, and if you were heedless. And I think everyone can kind of understand that kind of concept. Imagine if you lived in the, in the light of the Lord, to use some Christian terminology. Right? If you lived that way, that that's all you saw, what you, will, you will reflect that kind of belief. So when you see somebody, again those dials and those gauges, if you see someone that doesn't reflect, when I see someone that doesn't reflect that, reflects the opposite, I know that something has gone wrong. And then this sort of paradigm of understanding helps me be able to go in and sort of surgically remove, hopefully, those problems. And be able to analyze and demonstrate for somebody what's, what's going on. So we have these three dimensions that I talked about. We have correct action, okay, which is what we call a sharia. So all the sharia is, is legal uh, books and commentary and opinions on interpreting the primary sources. And that for us becomes correct action. And you guys have heard of the Quran, I hope? Okay. So there's 6,236 6, verses in the Quran. Only 300 of those verses deal with the law. Of all of the prophetic texts that we have, of the Prophet, we have about 60,000. Only 2,000 speak to the law. So the law, the Sharia, even though it's in our face all the time, it's actually from a textual point of view, less than 5% of the source text of Islam. And the vast majority of the Quran, the vast majority of the prophetic teachings, are ethical stories as they relate to our belief system. How we are to, to deal with neighbors, how we deal with ourselves, how we deal with calamity, how we raise our children, how we deal with the other, how we deal with ourself, how we deal with our parents, so on and so forth. Ethical uh, statements, ethical teachings. So the moral paradigm is quite large. So even though the law, from an intellectual point of view, takes up a vast space in the intellectual history of Islam, from a textual point of view, it's actually very minor. Because to do all of this, I mean, I'm kind of speaking from the perspective of somebody who's studied as, at a seminary. I mean, most people are not going to study at a seminary. How many people have studied at a seminary? Okay, so, there you go. <laughs> of the purportedly 114,000 companions that Prophet Muhammad left behind when he passed, in 623, only 20 were experts in the law. So look, I mean, even, even in this room, in another faith community, same, sort of same kind of statistics. So the law is, I got to tell you, very boring, very dry, very tedious, but if you want to, you know, play the game, if you want to read the dials, if you want to be able to understand the language, you got to go through that training. So the faith component, correct belief, how we, what, what does God mean for us? When I, say about, when I say there's no God but God, if a Muslim says that, there are certain things that you believe about God, certain capacities, certain attributes, certain traits, and also there are certain things that we believe that God is not, or that God does not do, and so on and so forth with all of the articles of faith. How, what is our attitude towards other religious traditions? If we believe in the revealed books and all of the prophets, so on and so forth, what is our attitude towards that? What is our belief system towards that? So this becomes our theology. And in Islam, our theology, the high theology is very similar to philosophy almost. Very, very intricate and very, very abstract and was not my favorite topic. <laughs> and then spiritual excellence, this is really what's the most important thing because this is something that everyone has to be a part of. See, the Quran, it posits three reasons why we exist. And this is, if you remember anything, maybe the most important. The first, God says in the Quran, I have not created you except 
to be in a state of worship to me. So one of our reasons, one of our essential reasons why we exist from the Islamic point of view is to worship God. That our life is not ours as it were, but it's really on loan to us. And everything in the created universe, everything that we perceive, everything that we see has been given to us, has been created for us to use in a certain way. So worship, acknowledging that, is an essential part of humanity. The second thing that God says in the Quran is He says, blessed is the person who improves themselves and wretched is the person who doesn't. So self-improvement, working on yourself, to be the best version of yourself is one of the essential reasons why we exist. So the, the Islam doesn't say, well, you know, just try, the be you know, try your best and that's okay and you are the way you are. No, you, you, we're, called to a, we're supposed to call ourselves to a higher moral standard to be a better version of ourselves, to not give in to our base desires, to not to give in to our uh, a low way of thinking, but to raise ourselves to a higher level of consciousness, aptitude, spiritual aptitude, spiritual excellence. And then the third reason the Quran posits why humanity exists, why all of this happened, is to build something in this world that works. There's a very beautiful verse in which God says in the Quran, He has caused you to dwell on the earth and has asked from you that you build it. Well, you can't build it alone. You can't build it with just people that you like. So this means that you are going to live in a plural, very diverse human community throughout time. So these three reasons, these three reason, meta reasons why we exist to worship, to improve ourselves, to do something collaboratively, are really the realm of this last area of this spiritual excellence. How do we combine this? So I can't follow the law and follow my belief system and hurt somebody. I can't follow the law and follow my belief system and break someone's heart. I can't follow the law, follow my belief system and, and kill innocent people. That doesn't add up. Something is wrong in that equation. That's not a cohesive way of thinking or a way of living. So then these become the really important ways that we understand and furthermore how we teach. So the law is not just one subject but several subjects. The law itself and interpretation and the Arabic language and grammar and syntax so on and so forth. And theology is the same way and a lot of theology actually is looking at other religions. Looking at you know Hindu Vedanta, looking at uh, atomic theory of Buddhism, looking at the Christian concept of the Trinity and its different denominations, looking at uh, rabbinic law and rabbinic theological uh, components, Kabbalah, things like that. You find all of that, all of this soup of thinking. Muslim uh, theologians over the course of history have worked with and commented on and added to and translated, so on and so forth. From the point of view of, well, how do we, how do we interpret, uh, how do we form the religion? Like, where does this all come from? And I know that this is very could be abstract, so I'm going to end very quickly and you know, I'll love to hear from you. The first source of authority we have, as I mentioned, is the Quran, which we believe is the eternal, uncreated word of God. So it is essentially one of God's attributes. You say God is light, God is merciful, God is the all-seeing. So the Quran takes that like understanding for us is that it's one of God's attributes. And as, as I said, there's 6,236 verses 114 chapters in 30 parts. And then we have this area called the Sunnah, which is, the Sunnah is a, a way or a, a principle, a habit. So everything that the Prophet said, did, affirmed, everything that happened in front of him that he was silent about or he commented on, all of that is a source of authority from us. We analyze it, we verify it throughout history, and we use that. So if you ask me a question, in my mind, I'm going to go back to these two sources. I mean, is there a verse that talks about this? Is there a prophetic moment or statement that, or story that talks about this? But then sometimes, because these are limited in size, you know, you can fit them, these books on a shelf, we have the consensus of the jurist over time, or scholars over time. So for example, everybody in the history of Islamic thinking argued that lying is forbidden. As a matter of fact, lying, lying is considered one of the grave sins. 
So that's an area of consensus. I can't come now and be like, well, actually, no, you can lie. It's not that bad. Or to steal. You know, these type of things are issues of consensus. So precedent is one of the ways we may be a more familiar term. The precedent of how we interpret these things over time becomes a source of authority. But all of this is, is limited, right? I mean, this is, does not cover everything under the sun. There are always new issues. There are always, always new transactions. There are always new uh, uh, crises and, and things that we need um, commentary on and we need guidance on. So the last thing I want to share with you is what is our, oops, yeah, there we go. What is, oh, excuse me, they didn't teach us this in seminary, so you have to. <laughs> so how do we interpret? And this is maybe the most relevant to I think what a lot of people's questions are today is that the first thing is that there is understanding the text itself. What does the verse in the Quran actually mean in its original Arabic language? What does the statement of the Prophet actually mean in its original Arabic language? Just as a text, just as a piece of language, what does that mean? That's one level. And then I need to understand my situation, my moment now. Just like I understand the text, I have to understand my moment. Uh, a lot of times, uh, because we have a lot of literature about usury and, and um, uh, certain prohibitions of financial transactions, a lot of Muslims ask questions about, well, can we, do, can we invest in this instrument? You know, how about the stock market? How, what if uh, you invest in a company that deals with alcohol because we don't, we don't consume alcohol? Things like that. So I have to understand the moment now. What does that mean to invest in a company? What does the interest of the bank mean? What does this type of financial instrument actually mean? And then I have to be able to bring the text into the moment. I have to link the two to be able to provide an answer. So that's a lot of stages. And many times these situations are things, the moment component are things that I don't know about. So I have to study or I have to ask. Or maybe the text is not clear to me, so I have to ask a teacher or another colleague that's more well-versed in that area. So this constant process of interpretation means that the linking component, the last part, is really the most important part. is to be able to find a copacetic way to link our ethical teachings, our moral teachings, in a way, in the moment in which we live now, that makes the most sense. Which is why Islam is essentially very elastic and very malleable in the way we practice, in the way we interpret throughout time. Especially in the, in the time that we live now because it's so different than the time of the original revelation of the text. I mean the way that we live life now is very very different than the 8th century Arabia or 13th century Baghdad or 9th century Cairo or these or where a lot of our medieval literature comes from. So this last component, this is where you have to be able to read all of the gauges. Not, not just the gauges of the religion, not just the language of the religious text, but you have to be able to read the gauges of the life that you live in now. And things vary from country to country. Like for example, you know the concept of citizenship, as we are all citizens, is a very <clears throat> new concept in human history. We didn't really have this for a long time. So what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis relations with people of other faiths? What does a nation state mean when I come and I look at Islamic governance, the section of the law that talks about that, and the nation state, or the nation state's our language, the, the state or the government, what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis our understanding of a republic or a federation or a democracy? And citizenship that essentially undoes any other type of uh, identity. Yeah, we're you know, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddha, but we're all citizens. And that relationship of citizenship in a sense trumps and is above all other relationships. That our identity primarily now is as citizens. And we vote and we argue about this bill or that bill, this piece of legislation, that piece of legislation. Well, that's very new. So what does Islam say about citizenship, democracy? You know, one can ask such a question. Well, I'd have to go through all of this process and be able to understand, well, what, is these, what do these identities really mean in its original context? as they were revealed in my, in my understanding. 
and then what does it mean today, and then trying to link them, so on and so forth. So this is the most important active process of Muslim leadership, Muslim intelligentsia uh, today to be able to, to go through this process. I've rambled more than I wanted to, uh, and I'm cognizant of the time, um, so please feel free to you know, ask anything that's on your, your mind. When I was in the sixth grade, there was a, a, a banner in the classroom that said the only stupid question was the one that wasn't asked. So with that, please shoot away. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Very, very enlightening. And um, at the at the end of your remarks just now, you you touched on a on a question that has been sort of in my mind for or a, a thought that has been in my mind for a long time. It seems that a lot of the kind of misunderstanding that goes on between people of one country and people of another country have to do with, in the West, a lot of people tend to look at Islam as identified with political entities, let's say, in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, and that's, of course, not true, because there are millions of Muslims living in countries that are not under Islamic governments. But that confusion, I think, often leads to misunderstandings where political disagreements get interpreted as religiously uh, imposed disagreements. So what, what is the best way, or, or what is a useful way for uh, non-Muslims to think of the relationship between the religion of Islam and political theory. What does Islam, if anything, say about political theory? Is, is that clear what I'm asking? Yes. OK, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> I smile only because only once every like seven years I get this kind of question, because this is essentially what my, my uh, doctorate work was, was in. So I, I get a little excited when I was like, oh, someone. All right, it, 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 we do have another service at 11.15, so. Yeah. <clears throat> Islam has a lot to say about Islam, about government. Uh, there's a whole section, or sections in uh, Islamic law and the Sharia that talk about the formation of government, the establishment of the head of state, uh, conditions and things like that. Um, but when you read that, you realize very quickly that it's an extremely imperfect system. And even the jurors themselves, they were sort of like agnostic towards, well, what kind of system we have is really not important, i.e., and they're almost not writing, but sort of saying because they all suck anyway, or they're all short-termed anyway. It's really about concepts of justice, uh, that, that people can practice their religion freely, and, and things like that. And if there's any form of government that allows these conditions, then that's okay. And if you look throughout Islam's political history, we've had all sorts of political systems. You know, we've had a, uh, a caliphate, we've had sultanates, we've had monarchies, we've had democracies, republics. Uh, some of them have been good, some of them have been atrocious, some of them have been so-so, just like any other sort of human political experience. So um, the form of the government, or the form of the state, is really, there's a, there's a blank there. there. It could be any form, which is one of the problems with, with this mismatch of our understanding in the West, because in the West, we're so domesticated that this is the best form of government. Well, in, in Islamic political literature, you don't have that. There is no best form of government because it's all man, woman made anyway, so it's gonna be imperfect. What matters is what the government does, how it meets the needs of its citizens, its people, and things like that. Um, so without getting too far off into the deep end, I think that's, that's one way of looking at it. The other thing is your observation is correct. I mean, there are many Muslim countries uh, today, and uh, it, it makes understanding the difference between religion and practice and politics very confusing, especially when you look at sectarian issues like Sunnis and Shias and 
you know, the interfighting between Muslim nations, you know, the proxy war uh, in Yemen between the Saudis and, and Iran, the, the constant battle over Bahrain between the Saudis and the, and the Iranians, uh, Iraq, Syria, things like that. So, yeah, it's just, it's just confusing. And, 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 and if it makes you feel any better, a lot of Muslims are confused themselves. Because the, the subject of Islamic governance is not something that you, you know, you don't, we don't teach at Sunday school. It's a very, you know, it's at the end of the book, as it were, not in the beginning of the book. So, you're, a lot of people don't get to that and they don't realize that there is a very rich, but there is an extremely vast literature about that. And if you're interested, I can point you to some uh, English sources that would be a good summary. Thank you for visiting with us today. Thank you for having me. One of the things I think that confuses many Americans or maybe many Westerners are the splits within Islam. And although Christianity is fractured into Methodists, Presbyterians, Catholics, and the like, for the most part, they don't hate each other or fight each other, with perhaps the exception of <coughs> people in <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> but we. We constantly see in the news stories about struggles, fighting, hatred between Sunnis and Shia. And then maybe there's Wahhabis or there's Sufis. And I don't think we quite understand why sometimes it appears that some Muslims hate each other more than they hate Crusader infidels. So when we studied the, the various Christian churches in, in school, the, the, the subject of, of that was the joy of sects. <laughs> but in, um, you're right to, to observe that in, in the Muslim world there's, there's not much joy in the sects uh, as there is in the Christian world. And it, it's, it, these are very big questions, so it's hard to answer you know, you know, very in, succinctly. But I think it's related to the previous conversation that a lot of it has to do with politics. Uh, and if you look at the relationship, the sectarian relationship, or that's a bad word, but the, the relationship between the different sects before, uh, for example, the establishment of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, or before the modern Saudi state, it would be very different than what's happening today. So these, in my understanding, these are political today, political tensions and not tensions of religion. And the proof is like in this country, uh, we have, um, there's a Shia school uh, mosque on Montrose Road. Actually, my kids go to that school. I'm, I'm a Sunni. My kids go to that school. Uh, we pray together. Uh, we celebrate, you know, holidays together. So I think because we're minorities together in this country, religiously, those kind of sectarian issues don't exist. But when, when we talk with each other and things veer into the heated zone, they're always political. Look what Saudi Arabia did, look what Iran did, look what's happening, they assassinated this person. It's all political geopolitics. Uh, and that's, that's what happens when religion and politics mix. It's, it's, a, very bad, it's a very dangerous uh, you know, mixture of things. Um, and uh, it's just true, I think, but all joking aside, even in other faith traditions, I think intra-religious conflict is oftentimes more severe than inter-religious conflicts. Uh, because everyone, if you're part of one religion, you always feel that you have a monopoly on the truth. I'm right, you're wrong. Uh, you know, I'm a true Christian, you're not. I'm the real Jew, you're not. You know, I'm a real Muslim, you're not. And I think that it's just the nature of religion uh, that it happens. The things like Wahhabis, uh, Sufis, those, those are not sects as, as the way Sunnis and Shias. Those are groups or... or um, sort of political activism perspectives. Wahhabism is sort of a... Uh, a fundamentalist uh, movement that happened uh, emerged at the end of the 18th century and uh, is the cause of much you know problems and turmoil and there are links between that that movement and you know organizations like al-qaeda and isis and, and things like that and, and sufism is it's still not but sufism is really the expression the spiritual expression in islam so it's just the name of the subject just like sharia is the name of the law Sufism or Tasawwuf in Arabic is the name of spirit, the spiritual practice and the spiritual disciplines. So, just sort of on those terms. First of all, I very much, uh, I very much enjoyed your presentation. Um, as somebody who, who lived about 30 of his 75 years in Muslim countries, one of the things 
that strikes me as a Christian as very distinctive about Islam is the way in which it infuses every sort of small aspect of life. When you live with Muslim neighbors, you see that religion touches what they say when they put their children on the bus to go to school, what they say when they take a cup of soup to a, a sick neighbor. It, it, people invoke God or a part of a surah maybe 200 times in a day when speaking, without thinking about it. It's just, it's just natural, like the air and the water. Christians don't do that. You know, I'm, an, I'm one, and maybe once in a day or once in a week, I really stop and think, I am a Christian. I'm doing this in a Christian context. And I wonder if you could elaborate a little on that, the, the way in which you know, a mother will, will, will say, Bismillah, alay khaliq, uh, throughout the day and to her children and to her friends and 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 so the religion is is enveloping a lot of that has to do with the the concept of repetition and invocation and remembrance which is a very key uh, central spiritual tool in islam so there's a verse uh in the quran that says the people that remember god standing sitting and lying down and contemplate the heavens and the earth so this concept that you're remembering God in every moment, standing, sitting, lying, meaning in every mode of your life, there's some form of invocation. If you collect all of the supplications and invocations of the Prophet, it would be impossible to do them all because it's like that's all he did. When he would open the door, he would say this. When he would uh, exit the door, he would say that. When he would eat, he would say this. When he was sick, he would say that. When someone's dying, he would do this. It was just never ending. So this concept of dhikr or constant remembrance is the tool that we use, one of the main tools that we use, so we do not become heedless. So it's, it's very much ingrained. Uh, and even just in our secular life, you know, repetition is the mother of skill. I mean, the more you repeat something, the more you're going to be good at it, the more it becomes part of your conscious, your subconscious. So it's, it's all, that, that's what happens. You, you know, and there are benefits we have in our literature to saying a certain thing a hundred times, a thousand times. So it itself is an act of worship, to recite like a verse X number of times per day, or morning and night, and things like that. So it's very common that, you know, that's, you know, that's what we do. One of the things that we do. And the idea is that it helps you stay connected to some of the things that I have been trying to communicate. All right. Um, well, since I have the mic, I'm going to ask a question. You're the boss. Um, it's, so... Um, as one of the few people in the room that have been to seminary, one of the, the areas that I enjoyed studying the most was about the practice of, um, of Ramadan. And could you, and it's definitely from a purely secular perspective, something we hear a lot about in the news. Can you just give us the, you know, the cliff note version of, of Ramadan um, so that you know, we're better informed about what it means and, what it, and how significant it is to the Muslim So life. Ramadan is the ninth uh, month of our calendar. Uh, we follow a purely lunar calendar, so it's about 11 days shorter than the Gregorian calendar every year. So our, every 36 years or so, our calendar makes an entire you know, cycle, uh, as it were, uh, in relation to the, to the solar Gregorian calendar. Um, in the month of Ramadan, and all of the months are in 29 or 30 days, depending on how we sight the moon, and we start fasting uh, before sunrise, uh, which means that we do not eat anything or drink anything. Nothing passes the, the oral cavity, other than air, of course, uh, until the sun sets. <coughs> and when the sun sets, every day we break our fast. So some people think we don't eat at all for 30 days. Well, we'd be dead if we did that. <laughs> So no, we do break our fast every day quite well, uh, and we can eat at night until the next day. And the idea in that practice is that, and of course, if you're sick and if you're traveling and if you're, you know, ill, you can't, you have, you know, diabetes or something, you know, you, you don't have to, you don't have to fast, of course. If you're young, you know, kids, things like that. But for normal, healthy adults, you know, uh, young adults, this is the practice. And as I said, it's one of the five pillars of Islam. It's one of the essential. Uh, uh, legal or, or religious practices that we have. And the idea behind uh, fasting is that we believe that we are created with a soul that is inside uh, or attached to the soul as our ego, our self, and that is enveloped in our body, in our physical body. 
And every time you feed the body, you kind of cloud the soul a little bit. Soul, heart, you know, the, the kumbaya stuff, I mean the stuff on the inside. And when you starve the body, then your soul or your heart is, is the opposite happens. You feed your, your heart. So part of fasting as a spiritual practice, it's hard to describe because you have to kind of experience it, is that by starving the body a little bit, you kind of awaken and you're nourishing your heart and your soul. So your soul becomes a little bit more alert, a little bit more aware, and you start to experience things and see things very differently than when, you, when you're eating and, and you know, having coffee you know, three or four times a day. So when you fast, you know, in the very beginning, you, you, just, you can't wait till you break your fast. It's sort of like, okay, how many more hours, how many more minutes, how many more seconds, and we come up with all of these ways. And, but what ends up happening is you end up finding yourself more efficient because you, you, you cut out eating and for, for working hours, so that means you don't have to you know, necessarily use the bathroom as many times. And so it actually, think about all of the things that come with eating, thinking about where you're going to eat, going to eat, getting sleepy after you eat, uh, having to use the bathroom to get rid of what you ate, just to fill it up again. That cycle, all of that stuff for the working hours after the first few days of fasting, all of those go, go away. So it's really just you. And then you're like, oh my God, where have I been the last 11 months? <laughs> yeah, and you get hungry and thirsty and, you know, and all of that, that stuff happens. But that's the point. And then you start to feel a little bit differently. You kind of feel alive in a way that you're not when you're eating and you're drinking and you're you know, hooked on caffeine. At least that's the theory behind it. Um, fasting also is a way for us to uh, just mechanically feel the way other people feel that don't have food and drink all the time. So it's for a way for us to realize that there are people that go, you know, there are people in this country, there are people in the city that only eat once a, a day or two, are malnourished you know, children at school and things like that. So it's sort of, wakes you up to like, yeah, this, this, you know, this sucks. We, we should do something about that. We should be more charitable. So it's a month of charity and a month, month of giving. Um, it's also, the physical fast is also a, a way, as a segue to a larger fast, which is, you know, to fast from thoughts, to fast from bad actions. It's very much like Lent. So a fast from, you know, I'm not going to say anything bad. I'm, I'm going to try not to think of anything bad during these months because the Prophet said, you know, a person can fast, and they cursed this person, and they did this, and they did that, and at the end of the day, all they got is that they were hungry and thirsty, meaning that they missed out on the whole point of fasting. So we don't want to be like that. We want to also be a higher version of ourselves during this month. So, you know, that's, that's what we do. And in our mosque, we, we provide uh, a meal a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to the community. You guys are all welcome to come. It's like a big party on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we have a nice property in Potomac, so you guys can hang out and basketball courts and everything. So you guys are more, more, more than welcome. Uh, and then we have an evening prayer service that's about an hour long. It's supposed to be an hour long. That's it. <clears throat> Sometimes we go a little bit over. Um, and um, yeah, so and then the, the end of it, as you would imagine, we have our big holiday and we eat. Just to add to that, on June 8th, sorry. Uh, just to embarrass the imams, on June 8th, we'll have an interfaith uh, iftar, which is breaking of fast and dinner. And I'll send an invitation to your interfaith communities. Uh, it will be coming in just a few days. So please uh, circulate to your parishioners who wants to join and give me the numbers. So we'll be very happy to receive you there. Thursday is 8.15 we expect you because the break of first will be about 8.30. Sunset. And then followed by a prayer and then dinner. We keep very good time in Ramadan. So <laughs> you, could be, you could be sure that the food will be exactly to the second. I know we have a few more questions, but I wanted Anne to um, just... Oh, well, I, I know people will start to leave, so. So I just wanted to take a moment to recognize that in addition to the imam, we have some people who attend the ICCP mosque who are here today. Would you all stand up so that we can welcome you, please? Please. <laughs> And I just wanted to say we're so happy that you could join us today. And we're really honored that we're building this relationship with the sorry, mosque. Sorry. Um, and we're exploring different things we might be able to do together as faith communities. And one of the things that happens is on Wednesday morning from 8 to 9, a group of women get together informally at Le Pan Quotidien at Wildwood Center. And anyone's welcome to join that informal group. We call it the Breakfast Club. <laughs> so uh, please join us there. And one of the first things we're going to be doing is there's another imam at the mosque, right? The <laughs> Imam Tarif uh, Shrine. 
and he works a lot with youth, and he's going to be coming on the 21st of May to meet with our J2A group, along with some of the youth from the mosque. So Great. that's a first step that we hope we'll be building on in yes. the year to come. So um, I don't want to wrap it up if you have time for more questions, but I just wanted to be sure that we welcomed our guests. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I have a basic question, and um, so Jesus and Muhammad both, you know, came to Earth at kind of pivotal times and wanted us to wake up to different things. And I know you're a scholar of comparative religions, and I just wondered if you could give us some perspective of some basic differences or samenesses in what they taught and what they were trying to wake us up to. Sure, great question. So, <clears throat> in our belief system, uh, we believe that all prophets, all messages, all previously revealed religions have the same essential message, uh, which is why we find so many similarities. Um, there are obvious differences <clears throat> because they come at different times in history and there are different things that uh, each your religious figure asks of their community, but the message is really the same, what you just said, wake up you know, uh, and, and worship the Almighty. Um, I think when it comes to Islam and Christianity, a good way to think about about these things is that Christ is really the Quran in Islam because Christ is the Word of God in Christian theology. In the beginning was the Word and then the Word became flesh. You know, John, <clears throat> right? Book of John? Okay. So, <clears throat> just making sure. So, the Quran for us is the Word of God. The Gospels are really like the Hadith. Sorry, previous slide. It's really like the sayings of the prophet because the gospels are really an account of the life of Christ according to the different you know people that observed it so if you're thinking of like a comparison chart the Quran would be similar to Christ and then the gospels would be similar to the hadith um, <clears throat> now we do not believe we believe in the infallibility of all prophets so all prophets including Christ are infallible morally infallible uh, infallible from sin and, and the like. I mean, they're, they're human in the sense that they get sick, they get tired, they need to eat, they need to rest, but they're infallible in their ability to deliver the message. We believe in the Immaculate Conception. And as a matter of fact, in the Quran, there's an entire chapter dedicated to Mary, in which God says when Mary's parents uh, wanted to conceive and the mother became uh, uh, impregnated with Mary, she says to God, I'm going to you know, dedicate what's in my womb to your service, thinking that it would be a boy. But when she gave birth and it was a girl, the Quran says, and the girl is not like the boy, meaning that the girl is better than the boy. And that's how the, the jurists have understood this verse, that, the, that the, there's a special quality to a girl that does not exist in the boy. So we believe in the Immaculate Conception. Uh, we believe that Christ was risen, but not crucified. Uh, that he was risen before he was crucified and the, that which was crucified was uh, somebody that looked like Christ but was not Christ and we actually believe in the second coming of Christ. So any differences that we have, we'll wait for him to come back and he will tell us who is right and who is wrong. No problems. No problems. Uh, <clears throat> one question that strikes me about a, a major difference I don't think there's much that gets people in America more upset than issues of justice. Hmm. And, and, and it seems to me, from what I understand, that, that uh, Islam has a different sense of, of justice than, than the Judeo-Christian tradition, which is fine, and I don't mean to judge that, but I do think that there is a difference in, I, I think that, that, that Shira law creates a lot more fear in Americans than maybe is necessary, but certainly there is a difference. And could you speak to that at all? Sure. Uh, the second part of your question first. I think that Sharia law, if, you, if people understood that Sharia law was about how you relieve yourself in the bathroom and how you eat and how you sleep and things like that, I don't think there will be any fear. It's just sort of how we conduct ourselves. Um, so when people are like, oh, Sharia law is going to come and take this and take that, they're actually not talking about the Sharia, they're talking about something else. So I think that it's very important that, that you know, again, with definitions and, and, and the language of Islam and things like that. But you do make an extremely uh, astute observation um, that there is a slight difference because justice 
in the Islamic ethical paradigm cannot exist if there's no peace. So you can have, we, it, it, justice is very much a ethical, uh, uh, is a virtue without doubt, but you can't have justice at the expense of peace. Uh, and that's really critical. I think because as Americans, much more than even Westerners, we, we have taken that for granted, that we live in peace, that we've free movement and you know, more or less things work and, and we're okay and we're safe. So we're always doing you know, justice, 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 and looking on the other side, justice, justice, justice. But a lot of those places, a, a, a push for justice in some parts of the world would make those societies collapse if there was not some kind of peace and reconciliation. And that's you know, what happened in South Africa. There was this concept of, well, let's do this you know, reconciliation. We all messed up. We all screwed up. Let's you know, talk about it and get over it so we can move on. And um, in Islam, this is very, very important, this concept that there has to be some sort of peace, establishment of peace before we enter into the, to the realm of justice. But when, when it comes to justice, uh, we believe that the Almighty has infinite names and attributes. And we categorize the attributes of God in three ways. There are the attributes of mercy and beauty. You know, God is love, peace, light, justice, uh, peace, love, mercy, compassion. And then there are attributes of majesty, like justice, the avenger, the one that causes death, the one that brings life. And then there are attributes of wholeness or completedness, the all-hearing, the all-seeing. We take from that that we as humans should hold ourselves to the attributes of mercy. We should be merciful. We should be compassionate. The attributes of majesty, of which justice is a part, that belongs to the Almighty. We do not want to be vengeful with one another. We do not want to be hurtful of one another. We don't want to cause death of one another. So uh, justice in the human uh, way kind of straddles that a little bit. So it's, it's not that it's not a virtue, but it's secondary to sort of mercy and compassion and peace. I mean, I know that you're probably thinking, well, that's not what I'm seeing on TV, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you as, a, as, a, as a, a man of the cloth, as it were. I mean, that's sort of <laughs> what we're trying to inculcate in our, in our people, but that's how we were taught, and that's what the sources teach us. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> as much as religion makes sense. As much as religion makes sense. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Up to you. Could you just help us understand ISIS a bit? And, <laughs> or, like, I think I'd, I'd have a better two minutes or less. I'd have a better task <laughs> explaining the Trinity than I would <laughs> ISIS. Um, you know, ISIS is an aberration of the of the of the primary sources. Uh, a lot of the concepts that they uh, advocate are just flat out lies, misreading of texts. Uh, literally misreading the Arabic of the texts, they're unlettered, uh, you know, buffoons. And um, that the, the, the whole thing in the beginning about the language of cricket and the dials of the plane, that's, that's really what that's why I use those images, is to impress upon us that these people do not know the language of Islam. They are not, half of what I said they do not know or they do not understand. Uh, and, um, you know, there are many causes and root causes uh, for that that, you know, time does not allow for us to discuss today. But it all comes back to not understanding the function of these texts and how you use them in the world in which we live, uh, which is essentially what this, this slide was, was about. And that's just as, as much of a summary as I can give you. That was a good summary, and I, I was timing you. You did that in about 48 seconds, so <laughs> that was excellent. Well, on behalf of all of St. John's, I, I first I'd like to give Dr. El Gahari a, a warm hand for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, thank and again, much. we really look forward to working together sure. um, going going forward. So if you have more questions, I'll we'll let you all take those offline. But thanks, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.